Uh, on call uh, with me here today this morning is Jason Hiller. Uh, Jason is electrical and instrumentation supervisor at Gacho Quay Mine in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Uh, Gacho Quay is a joint venture between uh, WS Group and Mountain Province Diamonds. Um, he has worked for WS Group for over 15 years. And uh, prior to Gacho Quay Mine, Jason spent 10 years at Sna Snap Lake Mine, uh, where he held the various positions as a lead maintenance engineer, a project planner, senior technical electrical specialist, and E&I superintendent. So over his career with WS Group, he has been fortunate to commission and start up both an underground and surface mining operation into full production. So Jason is also an associate member of the CSA Z462 Technical Committee for Workplace Electrical Safety Standards and also CSA Z463 uh, Standards for Maintenance of Electrical Systems Technical Committees. Okay, so we uh, Jason and I connected at the Electrical Safety Workshop last year through a common friend, Terry Becker, and uh, he uh, really, really helped. Uh, when I asked him to do this webinar for us, he really uh, agreed to uh, do this for us, to our audience of Grace Technologies. So basically, Jason is going to explain his personal experiences from the mining uh, operations on electrical safety and electrical equipment maintenance and how important the electrical safety and maintenance systems are for uh, system reliability at their uh, mining. So without any further delay, I will turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for this experience as well. Um, and thank you all for being on here and listening to my story. We uh, take something away or we prompt a, a good discussion. Okay, can you uh, move the slide, please, for me? Yep. Oh, so you are sharing the screen, so you need to just hit the uh, next button, so. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so that's my introduction that uh, Barry just went through, so I'll skip that. So my story is uh, I've been with the Beers Group for 15 years. Uh, Group is the world's leading diamond company. Uh, we employ more than 20,000 people across the globe. We refer to our, our business as a pipeline, the diamond pipeline. That's made up of It reaches the surface and it creates this, this pipe, which then you open pit mine uh, and on the underground to get the, the tail if, uh, if it's economical. And the other type of body is, is called a dike. And Snap Lake actually had a dike for an ore body. What happened with that was where the timber lake came up, it ended up filling the voids in the in the earth underneath of, of a lake underneath uh, underneath of snap lake and that dike was about two and a half meters thick and uh 
And so and it was about 80 meters below the surface, uh, below the Earth's surface. Um, so therefore, it was an underground mining operation. <clears throat> and the, basically, we were chasing the ore. So the ore would, would either die or dip or pinch off and start up somewhere else, depending on where the Kimberlite found the yeah, the place to go as, as it came up. Um, so being that Snap Lake was an underground mining operation, uh, the more ground that we uh, opened up, the more water that was brought into the mine. So the more water that was brought into the mine, the more we needed to pump. So by 20, around 2015, we were pumping in excess of 65 megaliters a day. We were treating that water and putting it back into the lake. Uh, the mine is located 220 kilometers northeast of Yellowknife, and it's accessed only by, by plane, so it's a fly-in, fly-out. We do have an ice road six weeks a year, or we did, I should say. We did have an ice road six weeks a year, and on that ice road, we would be able to bring in all the fuel that we needed for the year, as well as all the supplies that were required to, to mine uh, the ore body. Uh, we generated our power by diesel generators. And the site load was around 20 megawatts on average. So production started in January 2008. The satellite was placed into care and maintenance in December of 2015. We processed 3,000 tons per day and produced on average around 1.2 million carats per year. Uh, in order to ventilate the underground mine, we had two large fresh air raised fans on the surface that pushed 50,000 CFM of air to the mine. And that was used to ventilate around 30 active headings at a time. Um, and then we had to have another 30 headings serviced, ready to go uh, in case we lost a heading due to flooding or if the ore pinched up, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, we worked at two weeks on, two weeks off rotation, and the mine employed about 700 people. So the site generated power at 4160. We stepped up to 13,800 volts to feed the underground mine, and then stepped back down to 600 volts for the utilization power. So the infrastructure on, mine, on the mine is very similar to, to a small town, where we have an airport, we have a water treatment plant, we have a wastewater treatment plant, we have a process plant, a powerhouse, maintenance shops, um, an emulsion plant where we manufacture emulsion used to, to explode the, 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 the rock and the ore underground. Uh, so that was so that was everything that um, needed to to be maintained by the team. The ENI team, the electrical instrumentation team, we had about 25 people per rotation and that was made up of a superintendent, supervisors, planners, lead hands, electricians, instrument technicians, systems technicians, and a powerhouse operations and maintenance team, which consisted of a mechanic and electrician. So some of the challenges that we faced were that on, we're flying fly out. If anything couldn't fit on a plane, it could not come to the mine. Uh, unless we brought it up on the winter road. So it was extremely cold weather throughout the winter months, which uh, are about nine months of the year. Although the underground was kept at a constant seven to 10 degrees C. Uh, we had to deal with a lot of water and a lot of dust, as well as a lot of conductive diesel particulate from the mining equipment. Uh, Gacho Quay Mine. So Gacho Quay Mine was a pipe, is a pipe, and Gacho Quay is, is like Banner said, it's a joint venture between Beers Canada and Mountain Province Diamonds, and production started in August 2016. Being that it's a pipe, we are able to open pit mine this operation. And currently, we're mining, we have three pipes, we're mining 5034, Fern, and Tuzo, and the, the planned life of mine is close to 2030. 
So Gotcha Quay is, is located about 85 kilometers southeast of Snap Lake, about 280 kilometers east-northeast of Yellowknife Northwest Territories. Again, we have an ice road that supplies our, uh, supplies our fuel and supplies for the year. And power is generated by diesel generators. The site load is roughly eight and a half megawatts. Uh, we process about 10,000 tons per day, and that produces on average four and a half million carats per year. So similar to Snap Lake, Dr. Quay has all the same utilities and amenities that uh, is required to, to operate a remote site. We have uh, an airport function plant, process plant, we have a truck shop, we have a powerhouse, we have camp accommodations, and we have other various supporting infrastructure, such as the emulsion plants and a ammonia nitrate storage facility. So the electrical instrumentation team at Gotcha Quay is, is made up of, of 13 people, uh, which includes superintendent, supervisor, planner, electricians, instrument technicians, system technicians, and again, powerhouse operations and maintenance. Uh, very similar challenges. You know, it's a remote site, it's fly and play out, it's extremely cold. Only mining is done on the surface, so you're, you don't have the luxury of the, of the underground mine to, to control the temperature for the workforce. There are times where people are working out in, in excess of, of negative 50 degrees Celsius. Well, we have a lot of dust that's created, as well as there's a lot of vibration from the blasts in the pit. A little bit about uh, my career journey. So over the years, I've been fortunate to, to have been placed into multiple uh, positions. I started working at Snap Lake as a construction electrician, installing the electrical infrastructure in the process plant. Um, in that time, I, I had an opportunity to switch companies and, and to lead the frontline team responsible for the installation of the primary distribution system for the underground mine. So I took on that challenge. Uh, in doing so, I learned a lot about underground and uh, as well as uh, it piqued an interest uh, to me for continuing to work underground. Um, the Beers had posted a position for a maintenance electrician, which I had applied for, and I was awarded the position as a surface and underground uh, maintenance electrician. And I was fortunate to spend a lot of time job shadowing the electrical supervisor for the contracting company responsible for the development of the underground waste ramp. So that really fast-tracked me into understanding how the mining process worked, as well as what the services were required in order to sustain mining. Um, I was promoted uh, into the lead electrician role for the year into my employment. And in the lead electrician role, I was responsible for basically the team that prepared and maintained and advanced all the electrical services underground as well as the maintenance on the surface infrastructure. Uh, but that excluded the process part. Um, as the mine grew, it was apparent that that we needed a we needed a, a position um, for someone to be planning and keeping track of what was going on with the electrical equipment advancements underground. So the Beers decided to put a, a, a maintenance projects planner role and posted that, which I applied and I was successful. So having my experience with the underground, it opened the door for me to be promoted into that role. So in the role, I was primarily responsible for planning the underground advancements, which included preparing the winter road orders for new electrical equipment and supporting infrastructure to advance the mine. So I had to look at the long-term mine plan and forecast where the services would be installed a year ahead of time to ensure we had sufficient electrical equipment on hand to meet the mine plan. So in doing that, we developed a structured approach to our advancements where we could use the planned meters in the mining plan to forecast basically how many service advancements we'd have to do in the ore body and in the waste ramps. And that then informed uh, our equipment purchases, as well as I was able to get involved with uh, 
designing some of the electrical equipment that we're bringing to the mine and putting some some custom influences into into that equipment for uh, for maintenance as long uh, as well as safety so as the mine grew and grew um, the more and more electrical infrastructure was uh, was being installed and more and more uh, energy was being consumed and the beers wanted a single point accountability for all aspects of the electrical uh, and inst instrumentation department for uh, for surface and underground. So what they did was they, they posted a chief electrician position that I was successful in, in getting. Uh, I moved to a one week on, one week off rotation. So in this role, I was basically responsible for power generation equipment for the mine uh, and all capital projects related to, to electricity. Um, I became aware of CSAZ462 and the need for electrical safety program. And uh, we hired uh, actually an independent consultant to support the development as uh, just didn't have the time uh, to do that ourselves, to give it the attention that was required. So about a year into that, Snap Lake, the management team restructured the maintenance department and I was moved into uh, a role called the Senior Technical Electrical Specialist. And what I was responsible for there was overseeing the governance of the electrical maintenance program and for the life of them on power demand forecasting. <coughs> um, oh. Is everything all good, Brian? Yeah, I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, I need to go to the full uh, slide mode. I think. Yep. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, about a, about a year again after that, uh, it was decided that we we're going to restructure the, the maintenance department again. And we we're going to have uh, two superintendents um, basically for uh, undergrounds, and they were going to be responsible for all aspects of, of maintenance, mobile maintenance. Uh, mechanical maintenance as well as electrical maintenance. Um, and, and then I was posted to support uh, the superintendents uh, as the electrical technical uh, the specialist. Okay, so uh, that was successful for about a year and then we restructured again because we needed to have electrical people uh, responsible for the electrical department um, just proved that that the structure that we had just didn't, didn't work that well so i was moved over to an eni superintendent role with a cross shift this time um, and in that time that I spent as the EI superintendent, uh, we, we successfully implemented an electrical safety program. We implemented uh, an electrical equipment maintenance program for the primary distribution equipment site-wide. We also increased the site generating capacity uh, from 22 megawatts to 32 megawatts. So that consisted of installing two additional 4.4 4 megawatt generators and a 1.5 <coughs> megawatt auxiliary generator. We also installed a third 10 megawatt step up transformer uh, and an additional feed to the underground mine. So we're set up for the future. And that's when the decision came down to shut down operations at Snap Lake. Um, I was kept on site at Snap Lake for three months to plan the wrap down to steady state air maintenance. Uh, and that included an underground electrical infrastructure retreat plan power demand forecast, fuel consumption for the ramp down, and an essential service electrical equipment maintenance plan. So upon the completion of my work at Snap Lake, I was offered the ENI supervisor position at the nearing completion Gotcha Quay project. Initially, I was embedded into the commissioning and startup team. Taking lessons from Snap Lake, I got involved with the development and implementation of the electrical equipment maintenance program, electrical safety program, and the maintenance management workflow process. I'm now managing the day-to-day -day scheduled work 
Uh, and I'm the electrical safety program manager for the model. So I've had quite a journey um, in my career with the beers. And in that journey, I was able to, to take some lessons learned that I'd, I'd like to share and talk about with you guys today. Well, there are, there, there are lessons. They're basically things that I, I picked up that really helped me and, and the department to be uh, successful as well as uh, organized. Okay, so uh, in the following slides, I'm going to go into more detail about, about each of these lessons learned. Uh, so put safety first. So right after taking the chief electrician position at Snap Lake, we had an unfortunate arc flash incident on the mine. So what happened was there was an electrician was installing uh, a cable into a live power panel and the ground wire on the tech cable uh, popped out as he was entering it into the panel and it, it, it made contact across two phases of the live 600 volt panel. Uh, that initiated a, an arc flash, an arcing fault, which led to an arc flash. And the, the electrical worker's hand was, was burnt. Uh, shortly after that, uh, I had two workers working together underground, commissioning a couple pump starters. And what had happened was they were working side by side in two, pa in two panels. And one of the electricians dropped his screwdriver. And as he bent down to pick it up, he bumped into the other guy I was working beside him and he kind of fell into the panel and put his hand, uh, his bare hand onto a, onto a, a live uh, component on the start. <laughs> so out of the investigation, we had covered that we didn't have the best procedures or an electrical safety program. We weren't providing employees with the proper instruction on how we wanted uh, the work practices approached at the mine. Um, so that, that prompted us to develop an electrical safety program. Developing an electrical safety program provides a guideline to inform the content of our procedures as well as it gives everybody an overview of what the expectation is for the work practice approach to, to electrical work, specifically energized electrical work. Uh, we used standards as a resource. The standards outline the best, best practice requirements and guide on how to develop an effective safety program. We also, like I had mentioned earlier, we had also consulted subject matter experts to support with that development. We used tools such as bow tie analysis for high consequence hazards such as shock and arc flash. So this was used to determine what the critical controls were required to be in place and how we'll monitor them to ensure that they were available and that they were working. So we had to embed the electrical safety program into our company's occupational health and safety program. And we did that by reviewing all of our procedures and referencing all procedures back to the electrical safety program, as well as the procedures that we developed were in line with the, the existing occupational health and safety program. Um, we also have to embed the electrical safety program into the maintenance management workflow process to prompt electrical workers uh, at, when they're exposed to the, the arc flash and shock hazards to, to, to follow the electrical safety program requirements. Uh, so it's important that we had to train all workers on the requirements 
and that included non-electrical workers. So non-electrical workers are exposed to hazards, especially shock, and we need to train them. We need to train them to be uh, to be aware of what an abnormal condition looked like with electrical equipment. So we train them about look, listen, and smell, and what to do if they come across equipment that is an abnormal condition. So we use more eyes on the equipment to help prevent the catastrophic failure. Um, uh, so much like a company's pre-job field level risk assessment cards, we've developed one specific for electrical workers when the task exposes them to shock or arc flash. And as a, as a supervisor, I'm able to review them periodically to ensure that the electrical workers are understanding the equipment arc flash labels and how to apply the controls as per the electrical safety program. It also helps with the understanding for the employees and provides them with a structured approach to dealing with the hazards that they're exposed to. It also gives you a, a, a glimpse as you're reviewing them uh, into the maturity of your team's knowledge. So you're able to identify people that, uh, that may need a little additional training or coaching or mentoring. And it's important that we review and update the electrical safety program minimum every three years or when an updated standard is published or available, and when employees raise concerns or suggestions. Important to follow up on, on people's concerns and suggestions as they, as they arise uh, to ensure that the program works for the electrical workers. Operational readiness. So when operational readiness is not done well, the maintenance team suffers. The effort required to catch up is placed onto them. So in most cases, the maintenance team is chasing startup bugs. The planning team is busy planning changes to improve the operational performance of the plant after it's initially started up. And it, it's very difficult to do this in-house once the operation is running. So we're learning from Snap Lake where operational readiness was not even effectively, we were able to at Gotcha K be proactive in the needs of the maintenance teams. So what we had done was we embedded our operations people into the projects team for commissioning. So the team was familiar with the equipment prior to the plant going into operation. We developed a drawing register and requested drawings in both PDF and AutoCAD. Uh, so, and similar to the drawing database, we have an equipment operation, uh, operations and maintenance manuals register. So that provides electrical workers easy access to all the information they require to be able to maintain and troubleshoot the equipment effectively. Uh, we also have the commissioning records available. Okay, and we use the commissioning records to measure the baseline values against the values taken at the maintenance intervals as equipment ages. We also developed an asset register. We find the asset register is critical. This was used to loan all of the equipment to the computerized maintenance management system and for assigning equipment criticality ratings. So having a company standard for equipment nomenclature that is followed also eliminates confusion and ensures all equipment has a unique designation. So we had all the engineering studies provided and we used them for updating incident energy analysis to align to the latest IEEE 1584 standard and for forecasting process plant throughput increases from the original design. It enabled us to have the original information and be able to uh, plan what capacity increases we had available to us before having to um, increase uh, service sizes. So having a computerized maintenance management system also automates the maintenance program, provides easy access to equipment history when needed. Electrical workers use that very regularly. 
get information about the history of the equipment uh, to inform uh, the maintenance history as well as to inform maybe uh, previous failures and what was done to, to repair them. Uh, so operational readiness is, is key. Operational readiness is typically done before the plant goes into, into operation, when the property goes into operation. That doesn't always happen, and it doesn't always happen perfectly. A lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll have some very good tasks completed for operational readiness. However, the stuff that is left behind, unfortunately, maintenance teams have to deal with um, as they're trying to maintain and, and operate the plant. Uh, operational readiness can be done after the fact, be done while the plant is operating. However, you're going to have to most likely require some some support. So it is available to to reach out and to get people to to fast track that uh, those requirements into your into your system. Okay, so we, we, we developed processes. So we found that processes provide clear directions. So people know what is expected of them in the overall business process. People don't know where they fit in, so the, the overall process. Things do get missed. And you find, we find that without having the process, we lose structure in how we conduct our business. And we never seem to be able to get out of the reactive firefighting mode business. So in this maintenance management workflow process, we need to identify the streams that we have. So we identify, we, we have a work raised. So how we, how we raise work, how the work is planned, how work is scheduled, how work is executed, how we history record, and how we do job analysis for continual improvement. So we assign responsible position titles to each step in the workflow process. So everyone knows who is responsible for what step. The electrical safety program also has workflow processes that ties into the overall work management process, as I mentioned earlier. We needed to create KPIs to measure the success of the process and the compliance to the plan and schedule. We developed an internal audit plan and schedule to take a deep dive into the effectiveness, uh, a deep dive into the effectiveness of the maintenance program and adherence to the plan. So doing this supports our continual improvement of the program by identifying gaps and bottlenecks that may be overlooked. We communicated the process to the various teams on site, operations, maintenance, site services. And we posted the workflow processes, posters on the walls, hey. in the shops and other high traffic areas. Hey, Jason, do you mind just sharing your screen again? So it just kind of went back to a slide. Oh, slide. sorry. It's okay. Don't know what happened there. Um, give me one second. Uh, some slideshow. How's that? Nope, you got to change one more. Yep, that's good. Perfect. That's good. Yep. Okay. So we have we, we had to communicate the process to the various teams. Because people need to know how maintenance management, how maintenance is managed, and what that workflow looks like. And we found that having this process, it eliminates a lot of uncertainty, so it ensures everyone knows how they fit into the process. And it can also be used to hold people accountable for their part in the process. As part of this maintenance management workflow, we actually also developed a manual that describes in detail the requirements of each step process. So developing maintenance plans. So having unplanned outages 
that cause significant interruptions to mining operations at Snap Lake due to flooding. When the power goes out, the water floods very quickly. Wow. Uh, so we found that when we opened equipment, that we had this diesel particulate that had allowed the high voltage to track between the phases. So it was obvious it had been going on for a while before we had a, before we had a fall, causing the outage. So there's evidence of corona discharge all around the inside of the electrical equipment. And what we found was that we had never actually cleaned the inside of the equipment because we had no maintenance plan. We had some inspections, external inspections. However, we had no maintenance plans to manage the, the contamination that were, was developing inside of the underground electrical equipment. Uh, so we looked at, at electrical equipment standards, and so electrical equipment maintenance standards. We used them as a, as a resource. We also had to do an equipment criticality analysis. So we basically decided what equipment was critical to safety, to the environment, and to the operation. And we decided from there that helped us inform what maintenance strategies we we're going to apply to our equipment. So the, the electrical equipment maintenance is for safety first and then reliability. So industry has shifted the focus towards safety versus reliability as the main driver for maintenance. And that's because the company is concerned about their image, cost, and recruitment. People want to work for companies that make safety and maintenance their priority. So here we have to ask ourselves a few questions. How could the equipment fail? And what is the operating environment? How often will the equipment be operated? We use the operations and maintenance manual. We created bills of materials for each piece of equipment, decided on which spare parts needed to be kept on hand and what ones you can order as needed, ones were less critical. And some of the benefits of the electrical equipment maintenance program was that it assured that the electrical equipment and systems were operational and will function as intended when required. So it assured that the, the electrical equipment was within applicable standards and manufacturer's tolerances, it assured that the electrical equipment was suitable for continued service. We eliminated downtime by simply cleaning the electrical equipment periodically. And we, it, it assured us that the electrical protective devices would operate as per the engineered time printers, and that the posted arc flash labels will, in fact, allow the worker to dress up to the appropriate level of protection for the hazard. So it ensured continued service of the electrical equipment. As well, it gave people assurance that the condition of maintenance for the equipment for the, for the non-electrical workers who operate the equipment, the locker, and the reliability of the electrical distribution uh, equipment systems. So if the equipment, we found if the equipment is well maintained, it is safe and reliable. Production targets will be met, with typically less stress on the employees. So it's important to have detailed task lists work instructions, and to develop a third-party specialized testing matrix. Develop procedures. Okay, so procedures. Procedures provide guidance on how you conduct business. Procedures provide the employee with the information required to complete their tasks safely, especially for tasks that are not done regularly. Having the procedure will ensure tasks 
are completed to the standards the company sets. We, we use task-based risk assessments to support the development of the procedures. We also use the electrical, uh, we also use the, the standards, uh, the electrical safety standards, electrical equipment maintenance standards to inform the procedures. We also worked with teams and hired a subject matter expert as well to facilitate our assessments. So our, to, the benefits of having procedures is that it ensures all employees are approaching work the same way. It reduces the frustration between your cross shift crews as everyone is doing work the same way. So some tips was to use a standard template that's easy to follow. We need to avoid using too many words we need to be specific and direct. Now there's a bunch of people that, there's a bunch of different types of uh, people that how they absorb the information. So you need to include pictures and you need to include pictures as well as um, we put the, the procedures online uh, through an LMS learning management system. Um, and the procedures were actually read out to the employees, uh, as well as um, they were available uh, in print so that the employees could have them in the field uh, on hand. So developing procedures is, is, is really critical to medium and to high risk work. <clears throat> Non-routine work, tasks that require a sequence or specific instructions, and for overall processes, we need to have procedures. Some examples are the management of change process and the procurement process. So manage changes. So in my experience, when changes are not managed properly, it creates unnecessary frustration to lack, due to lack of information. Schedules are blown out, higher costs are incurred, and critical items are overlooked. Managing changes impacts everything from morale, safety performance, schedules, and costs. When you manage changes properly, the resistance to the change is dramatically reduced. So in order to ensure that you're managing changes, that you keep morale up within your team, you need to communicate to the team. You need to understand the rationale. We need to include the team, request input from the team. If we do this, we'll obtain buy-in and the change that's being made will, will, will be supported by the team. So for safety, we need to do risk assessments. We need to make sure that we have all the controls in place, that we've put engineered solutions in, that our art flash labels, our results tables are updated. People are informed and trained if required on the new change. As far as schedule goes, when the work is planned, material and resources available, that will support an efficient execution of the task. Fine, without having things <coughs> managed, we don't find ourselves looking for parts trying to find drawings, creating them on the fly. We also have the ability to schedule outages, avoid impacts to production. And for cost, it reduces wasted time. There's clear direction, there's no rework, and reduced equipment downtime. You get this by being able to plan and schedule your outages. And when changes are being managed, it's important to include all stakeholders. So justify the need for the change. What is the current situation? What is the proposed change? And what is the desired outcome? Measure and monitor how effective the change was and communicate those results to the teams. When changes are managed effectively, you get the right work at the right time with the right people. Some of the examples of, of changes that need managing are new installations. 
We need to ensure that new installations meet the site standard, site spec, and are certified for use in your jurisdiction, Canada, United States. Uh, we need to manage the protective device setting changes. To make protective device setting changes that impact the incident energy levels that the workers are exposed to. We don't manage these changes to potentially under-protect our workers, give them a false sense of security. <clears throat> the electrical safety program, anytime we do updates to the electrical safety program, those changes need to be managed. They need to be communicated to the team. And procedures and process changes. Anytime we make an update to a procedure or a process change, we need to be able to communicate that to the teams that are involved. Continually improve. So to me, continuous improvement is a general term. It's just really learning from equipment failures, learning from human errors during that incident investigation, and identifying and making adjustments to processes, programs, and procedures when bottlenecks are identified. It's a lot harder to change the human and the environment. To make the environment easy to navigate for the human. The thought of developing and implementing an electrical safety program or electrical maintenance program may be overwhelming, depending where your company is on the maturity scale. It was a very overwhelming for me. So there are companies that offer consulting services that have the support develop the workflow process, the workflow process, and maintenance or safety programs to suit your site's specific needs. We need to treat these programs and processes, we need to treat the development of them, we need to treat them like a project. We need to define the scope of work, we need to decide what the deliverables are, what the milestones are, and what's the desired outcome. That will inform a framework, a table of contents. Put together a stakeholder group, community-based development, and follow a formal project execution plan. We create development and implementation schedule. <coughs> schedule committee meetings and keep minutes. In my experience, having a structured approach to managing the work practices, the workload, and a team actually frees up your time. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Can you hear me? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we have we have a lot of questions. I think. Uh, story. Yeah, I mean, thank thank you so much. Thanks uh, for your time, and uh, we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna. Start with the questions. Uh, so the first thing is, uh, are the superintendents MSHA certified? Um, were the superintendents MSHA certified? Yes. I, be I believe MSHA is a... a uh, mining is safety. A yep, it's a mining safety and uh, health yeah. administration. Yeah. Oh. In, in Canada, specifically in the Northwest Territories, um, we have what's called a supervisor certificates, levels levels one and levels two. And what that is, is that's a test based on what's called the Mines Act. So in order to become a supervisor or superintendent, you must study the Mines Act and pass a test getting greater than 70% success rate. And all superintendents and supervisors That's are true. certified uh, that way. Oh, cool. So next question is, uh, what type of software is implemented? I what type of software? Audio, Can you hear me now? What type of software is implemented uh, for CMMS? You talked something about the computerized maintenance management systems, right? So what type of software you guys use? Is there something that uh, specific you can share or I'm not sure? Yeah, um, so we use uh, SAP okay. uh, for all of our um, maintenance management, uh, or so, for, sorry, for our CMMS. Um, in using SAP, uh, we found that 
it's not super user friendly. However, if we provide training and if it's regularly used, it becomes quite easy to navigate. Okay, that's cool. So uh, I have a, a question that's based on one of the arc flash incidents you mentioned through your experience, right? So why were the E and I tech allowed to work on live energized equipment? I'm assuming they are qualified electrical workers. That's correct. Yes, they were qualified electrical workers. I was actually a, a supervisor as well as a electrical worker, and they were contract uh, company that was providing services, uh, site services to to the mine site. Uh -huh. So. What had happened there was that we did not have a very good contractor management uh, program in place. And there was work being done that didn't meet the beer's standards uh, for electrical work. And that basically, that incident happened. And out of the outcome, uh, sorry, out of the investigation, some of the actions also included uh, embedding contractor uh, support workers into the beers team, as well as having them follow our uh, our occupational health and safety program. Cool. Thanks, Jason. So the other question is, uh, do you have redundant equipment so that the facility can be run by one set of equipment while the second set is being maintained? So at Gotcha Quay, we actually have a single stream uh, um, in, our, in our process plan. So Basically, every piece of equipment uh, throughout that process is, is a critical piece of equipment. Uh, we hold spares on site so that if we have a failure, we're able to replace that, that failed equipment uh, in a timely fashion. At uh, Snap Lake and in, actually in the, in the powerhouse, uh, In the powerhouse, we have a redundant, uh, we call it the N plus two operating philosophy so that we can always have enough generators to supply the site demand while we have one in hot standby as well as one down for maintenance. Okay. Thanks, Jason. So the next question is uh, one from the audience. I'm going to combine that with my personal question as a uh, Listen to your presentation. You mentioned you have electrical equipment maintenance program primarily to for safety, right? Safety is the first element of what you want to accomplish with the maintenance program. And the second being the reliability aspect of it, right? So, and also you mentioned something about the equipment criticality and ranking as you try to put this program in place for the maintenance. So having said those two elements, so how do you normally prioritize this equipment based on the criticality when you take the safety first into consideration and reliability next what is your method yeah so <clears throat> we basically we have a a decision matrix where we look at you know what is the impact to safety and that's based on the consequence level of an unwanted event failure uh, we look at the environment how the environment would be impacted if we had a failure of a piece of equipment. And then we look at reliability to see if the plant would be down or production would be interrupted. And based on the results, we develop the flow chart that takes us into either a criticality A, B, or C. A being vitally critical to safety, environment, or production. And that then informs our maintenance strategies that we deploy onto that equipment. We also then look at the, the, the criticality B stuff that we don't necessarily, won't necessarily be a, a catastrophic impact, safety, environment, or production. And we then put our, our maintenance strategies against that Sometimes it's less scripted, but we also have to look at the operating environment. And then when we have a criticality C, that basically has no impact, won't have any impact on safety or environment or production. And a lot of that stuff is uh, 
in run to fail. Okay. That's cool. Thanks, uh, Jason. So next question is, have you had problems related to harmonic distortion, power quality issues in your equipment or generating system? Uh, no, but I believe due to due to the fact that we, we generate our own power, we're isolated from a utility. Mm. Uh, we have very Super good control. voltage regulation on our system and we don't have a lot of VFDs uh, on the system. Uh, so our power quality is extremely good. Okay, cool. Thank you. So the next one is, uh, is there an electrical lockout tagout system implemented out there at the mining sites? Uh, I mean, uh, they haven't heard something that you mentioned in the presentation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So that, that, that would be another very important procedure. Uh, would be lockout tagout. So we have a very strict lockout tagout uh, process. Uh, it's identified. It's it's broken out into two categories. So you have category one, which is going to be your single point isolation with only minimal amount of workers, uh, as well as then we have a category two, which is when the uh, it's used basically in the process plan. So when you have to isolate multiple different systems, whether it be air or electrics or, or, or um, mechanical uh, or hydraulics, and you have multiple disciplines all working together, then we, we, we actually move to what we call as a lockout uh, matrix. And in that, if we, we have a very detailed way of uh, using the PNIDs to identify which equipments uh, can impact the, the work that's that's being done. And we are able to identify them all on the list and, and put control locks in place and use lockbox. And then we uh, people put their personal locks on the lockbox, but they're able to review what's locked out and, and have the PID and see the physical locks on the equipment. We use a lockout coordinator to coordinate that employees. Cool. So the next one is like probably a generic question about the facility. So how many acres of land that you guys use for the mining operations? At that's, a, that's a tough question for me to answer. Okay. Uh, I would say that the, the open pit is Let's just throw a number out there. This is this is an estimate. Um, I believe the property. I, I'm not sure actually. I, I don't know the exact. That's fine. The yeah. Property. Yeah, we'll probably get back to them. That's fine. Uh, so, what is the highest voltage that you use in the mine? Is it a 4160 or do you go above 4160? Uh, I got your query. We generate at 4160. Okay. We generate at 4160 and we don't go any higher. It's not late. We went to 13,800. And that was just due to the distance from the powerhouse down to the bottom of the mine. The mine was over two kilometers and a 15 degree uh, decline. Okay. So, this one is uh, from me again. I have one question. I wrote it down. I want to ask you. Uh, so what are some of the challenges that you have faced, I mean, uh, to implement electrical safety program or a maintenance program, right? So everything requires a budgeting and nothing is broke given the situation. So how do you get a management approval or some of the pushbacks as you go and ask for the budgets for uh, maintaining the equipment or adding up a new safety program or developing existing program to meet the uh, current standards and search. So what are some of the pushbacks and how do you overcome those challenges? Oh, uh, well, De Beers, De Beers is a very uh, progressive company that uh, is very focused on, on safety uh, as well as uh, reliability. So with the beers, we basically put together uh, justification uh, that shows that, let's say we have to develop the we have to develop the plans 
we have to have our criticality assessments done. We basically have to have all the steps required to, to develop the, the maintenance program to inform what our, what our operating budget um, will be. Now, if we don't have the, uh, we don't have a portion of the, the, the electrical equipment maintenance program or, or the six program developed properly and we need support, uh, then basically we just prepare a justification that outlines the need for the uh, support and we budget it in our in our in our budget and uh, in some cases we'll have to do presentations to to management uh, based on the likelihood of the equipment failing the criticality of the equipment uh, to the process to the safety to the environment uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered that question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's no one way, right? So that's the reason I asked you. I mean, uh, so the next one yeah. is, uh, is there any focused area? So how do we justify the aging of the equipment when you're trying to put this maintenance programs together, right? So when you define the maintenance program for different types of assets, so how do you categorize the aging equipment and their prioritization into the equation. So how does that play when you're trying to prioritize the maintenance tasks? Uh, well, the age of the equipment uh, plays, a, plays a, a role. I mean, as the equipment ages, you're, you're, you're going to uh, be more susceptible to, to failures, uh, especially, especially if that equipment hasn't been maintained for a period of time up until, uh, up until now, um, I've been fortunate actually to to have operated uh, you know two two brand new uh, properties with with equipment that was latest vintage, um, and and uh, and it has only operated in South Lake was ten years in Dodge Quay has been five years now. Uh, but age of the equipment and the uh, the service that the equipment is under, uh, as well as the environment that the equipment is in, uh, would all would all play a, a play a role in uh, in what type of maintenance tactics were were put against that uh, that specific piece of equipment. Now we also have life cycle planning, which would be a replacement schedule. So if the equipment is getting uh, is not supported anymore, or uh, is showing signs of, of aging, uh, we would basically replace that. If it, if we okay. Hey, do you mind advancing the slides so the audience have the contact information of you? So just in case if they have any questions, I mean, that's the Jason's uh, information on the screen. Uh, so, and then the last question is basically, you talked about the change management on one of the lessons learned. So, and also you touched briefly about involving uh, your work uh, staff who performs the task staff on the field, also while developing the safety and maintenance programs, right? So can you elaborate the importance of involving your crew while developing any of these programs? I think that plays a significant role, I guess. I think I want you to explain or elaborate on that end. Yeah, I mean, what we've learned is that <clears throat> You know, if you don't include your crew, and your crew are the people that you're relying on to perform the the work, uh, if the crew is not uh, informed or if they're not involved with the decision making, uh, they they typically will come back with with a lot of questions and and a lot of frustration. You can sense um, because. They basically know what needs to get done and how it, how it gets done. Uh, there, there's also other situations where when you make a change, it impacts additional stakeholders. Uh, and if those stakeholders aren't, aren't engaged uh, at the onset of the plan uh, or of the, of the change, the justification for the change, then you find that you know, you'll 
indirectly impact somebody else's uh, world, basically. And when when that happens, um, you know, people people seem to to react uh, with frustration, with like, why wasn't I involved? And you know, in order to uh, just the more you include people, uh, the better the product is at the end. You get a lot of different insights from, from everyone's perspective, as well as there's some, some specialists and subject matter experts on your teams in certain areas. Um, it's just, it's so critical to, to include your, 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 your teams and the stakeholders that, that are involved. Okay. So, so lastly, I think this is a closing remark. So basically, uh, Jason is doing this during his off time, which he mentioned 14 days is on site and then 14 days is back home. That's the time he is doing this for us. And thank you so much for, again, doing this for us, Jason. Really appreciate all your uh, experiences sharing uh, with our audience. So last question, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Well, <laughs> I, I, I enjoy being out in the lake. I enjoy fishing. Uh, I enjoy playing sports. Uh, I enjoy hanging out with family and friends. And, and as of lately, as of late, with with COVID and everything that's going on in the world, it's been uh, it's been a, a tough time uh, to to get out and to, to do the things that that I really enjoy. Uh, but yeah, I'm a I'm a water warm weather type of person. I enjoy uh, I enjoy being on the boat and doing water sports. And I really don't like being cold. So it's kind of funny that I work <laughs> for half of my time. All right. Thank you so much again, Jason. Thanks for your time. And uh, again, please feel free to take the uh, exit survey as you exit the webinar. And uh, we'll definitely look forward to talking to Jason again sometime in the near future about getting more of his experiences and uh, asking more questions to him and gaining more his wisdom and knowledge. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thank day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.